10.30, let's get started. Uh, I think we've given out enough. Well, anybody has any assignment two questions, I'll take them in the next two minutes. Soon if you're in this room, you've probably completed it. I don't want to do a poll, so I won't do that. Uh, yeah, it'll be fun to talk about what happened and how uh, there are intent, an intended way that I wanted you to break it, and another way that you all found that was also really cool. So it's good, good work. Anything? No. All right. Will we get oh. a bonus if we did it in the non-intended? I think so. Yes, I will. So I think it's a little bit more difficult, but it'll be like I don't know, two or three or five points. Depends on how many people did it. So on Monday we talked about path attacks. So we saw that if a program uses the path variable to look for an executable, the path variable, right, all environment variables are controlled by us, by the attacker. So we can influence that path variable and make it be whatever we want to get the program to execute whatever program we want. The same thing occurs with the home environment variable. So we talked about home is used by the shell when doing the tilde expansion, right? So if the program tries to, execute, uh, tries to access something like tilde myfile.txt, we can change the home environment variable to point to wherever we want and to make this program execute now with our version of this myfile.txt. So whether this is a security vulnerability or not, right, depends on what the application is doing with this file. Uh, but if this is a set UID application and it uses this file to decide what permissions to give you or uses it as some sort of configuration file, now we, the attacker, have full control over the contents of that file and we can get the program to uh, edit, uh, edit or read any file that we want. So how can we prevent these attacks? Yeah. Signing. Signing, in what sense? Sign what? Ooh, signing the file. Yes, we could use fancy crypto things, which we saw how well they work. <laughs> Even alleged experts like myself can get it wrong. All right, so we can sign the file to make sure that it's a file that hasn't been tampered with and that it has the right signature. Uh, what else? What are some other ways we could prevent? So that would prevent the probably the home path, right? Ch root. Ch root. So we could execute the program as ch root, so it only has access to there. Um, yeah, that would limit the scope of the attack, right? But if we can still modify the path and home directories inside that ch root, we can maybe manipulate the program somehow. What's the key problem here on both of these cases? Thank you. 
environment variables. What's this, is it? It's not just the environment variables themselves that cause the problem, right? It's not the existence. Accessibility to them. Yeah. Well, the fact that it's not also not just accessibility, right? The application can read all of its environment variables, but what is it changing based on those environment variables? The pipe itself. Yeah. It changes what files it's executing in the first case and what files it's opening in the second case based on values that are controlled by who? The attacker, us, right? We control environment variables. They're not defined in the application itself. So what would be, yeah? How about running up, uh, the environment in a container? In a container, you're still, you're restricting what it can do, but it can still do anything it wants to in that container. Yeah. Still, the vulnerability is still there, yeah. right? It's just you're limiting the scope of what the attacker can do. But attackers are very clever, right? Attackers only get smarter as time goes on. So even if you've restricted them in there, if that's enough for them to do what they want to do, then they don't care, right? So how do we fix, like the second case, right? Your application is reading a file tilde slash myfile.txt. How do we fix this? Absolute pass. If we gave an absolute pass for this tilde slash myfile.txt, is the application ever going to read the home environment variable? No. Then we can't influence what file it's going to open. Right. Same with the path. Right. If we execute files from absolute location, if we exec slash user slash bin or slash I'm trying to think of more ls's slash bin slash ls, right? Then it doesn't need to look up in the path which file to execute, right? The path environment variable is only used when it can't, it doesn't know where this file is located. If you just said execute ls, well now it has to look up in the path about where is ls, right? So that's actually kind of the big, one of the big takeaways is if you're ever executing an external command, you should always use absolute paths of what to execute. That way you know your program is only going to execute that file. Uh, similarly, you should never use home relative paths. Kind of the big solutions here are just, are, don't do that. Stop doing that. You're hurting yourself, right? Um, yeah? So, uh, so how do we resolve the flexibility which environment yeah, so how do you deal with, well, so yeah, there is a lot of flexibility, right? You have to either, you, you have to, tra you can see that there's clearly a trade-off between the flexibility and, um, so what could be some ways you could gain the flexibility of using the path, for instance, right? Path is very useful. What's the key problem about relying on the path environment variable? Also true, but here we're talking about so let's focus on set UID applications, right? Because these are the ones that are much more interesting. These are the ones we can we can control, right? Uh, these are still good good practices because you never know when a you can't control where that application is going to be executed, right? So a word on your system or my system is probably not mission critical, but on a government system where it's being used to access classified information, that is environment there, not the application itself. Yeah. Can we, before running, can we verify that the path variables are what it exactly is on a IP system? Yeah, so what, so, okay, yeah, so why? Like, what's the core problem with relying on that path environment variable? It can be changed. It can be changed by the attacker, right? It comes from the attacker. So one way to get that same flexibility is to overwrite it with our known good environment variable, uh, path variable. Uh, that could still be tricky, because what if the paths that we're putting in there don't exist on the system? 
and then the attacker can create that path, and then now they're able to influence. So it also becomes very tricky of how you do that. You have to you know, guarantee that every directory you put in the path can only be writable by you, the user of this program, and not writable by anyone else. Um, it gets to be, it can be very tricky. So you're better off with doing um, you know, absolute paths. Any questions on this attack? Yes. Um, I, I can put something on this attack. How the common attacker can change the path variable of the cargo system? Does it have physical access, something like that? Yes. So in all of these attacks we're looking at, we have local access. So we have local access to the system. We're trying, but we have normal user access. So we're trying to leverage that into better access on the system. Um, so in this case, we are executing the program. Programs, when we execute them, inherit their environment variables from us. So in this way, they'll get uh, the environment variables from us, the user, and they're running a set UID, so they're running as the permissions of root, and that's why we want to control it. Okay. So there's other, so we're looking at kind of file accesses and file system changes. So there's other kind of games we can play. So what kind of, on like a Linux Unix machine, so what types, what's a link? What type of links are there, like in the sense of a file system? Symbolic. Symbolic. What is it? Symbolic. Symbolic and hard. Hard? hard. I mean. Soft and hard links? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, are there different types of links? What, are, what does it do? <coughs> what's the purpose? It's like a shortcut to another. Yeah, it's like a shortcut, or it has some name, and it means, okay, this path, when you access it, actually refers to some other path. They're kind of like pointers in the file system. Right? You can say, okay, if you want to access this directory, hey, look, this directory is actually somewhere else. Um, let's see, can I do this without me? So... Okay, so here you can see in my, like, my tilde, so when I do ls la tilde, what's it looking like in here? Home, yeah, so if I do environment, so if I do uh, echo home, right, this is gonna tell me this is my current home directory. And if I echo path, this is actually the path of everything that's gonna execute on my system. A lot of jumping here, I'll probably clean this up at some point, but over the years you use the same system and you just, like, uh, what is this, like some Ruby RVM stuff that I never use anymore, some other scripts I was using like four or five years ago, but I just keep putting them in here. Uh, rather than change it and have something break. But anyways, so we can see that I have in my tilde slash, let's say, I don't know, uh, teaching folder, that's a link to Dropbox slash teaching. So, when I ac so if I access teaching slash CSE 545, right? So when I access that in here, it knows, okay, this path, when it sees an element of the path and it says this path is a symbolic link, that means substitute this for in my Dropbox folder slash testing. Uh, so in this way, the benefit is, uh, is I'm uh, constantly working on my Dropbox, so I never have any problems, hopefully. So it turns out that symbolic links can actually be turned into really cool security problems. Uh, all, actually a few different security problems. Um, so for instance, some applications will verify that a file exists, but not check, hey, is that file a link to another file, or is it a certain file, or the permissions of that file? Um, so how might we be able to take advantage of this? So let's say an application checks that a file exists, and if it exists, it opens that file and reads and writes to it, a set UID application. So if that file doesn't exist, right, so the first
first we could create a file with our own name, right? And then it would open that file and write to that file. Then we've gotten that application to write to a file that we control. Could be interesting. Even more interesting is to get that program to write to any file on the system. So if we create a symbolic link from that file to, let's say, etc shadow, and then get it to, or etc password, and to get it to write out a new user account on the system, now we've actually tricked that application into writing to a file that wasn't intended. Um, so this is the basic idea. So if we can create symbolic links and get that application to open files, if the application checks and says, okay, I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna open files in this certain directory, right? So it checks, it's constraining itself to one directory. And then it opens one of those files, it writes to it, does some any kind of permission manipulation. Well, now, using symbolic links, if we can write into that directory, we can create a symbolic link to any place on the system. And we can get that application to write anywhere for us. We can get it to write to the SSH authorized key file. We can get it to write to, uh, I think of other cool things. ETC password is a big thing because you can add new accounts to the system. Uh, ETC shadow too. And so another actual kind of wrinkle to this is oftentimes applications will create temporary files, uh, but they'll not actually, they oftentimes won't check, hey, is that file successfully created? Is that thing I created a file and not a symbolic link? Okay, because if we can guess what that file name is gonna be, then we can create symbolic links to other files and get use the same mechanism to get the application to open files uh, that we want. So let's look at an actual attack of this. So this is called the DDAP gather attack. Anybody actually ever use this tool? The common desktop environment? I have tried to look this up. It's a super old Unix graphical user interface. Um, so this was the utility, this DDAP gather, and it, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, it was set UID root because it needed to do administrator stuff. I don't know exactly why. Uh, what it did was it tried to create, uh, it created a directory, a specific directory, and gave that permissions on that directory 055, 555. So what's 0555? Read execute, yeah read execute for each user group and world. Right? So it seems like a normal thing, this is what you want to do, right? You want to create a temporary directory, you want to store some files in that temporary directory, whatever. But, so the file name that it was trying to check was var dt app config app manager generic display zero. So this is the file, this is the directory that it was trying to do and change these files, but it didn't check, hey, is this thing, does this thing already exist or not? <coughs> so it would open this file, set it to be 0555, and then start changing it or doing whatever it wanted to do with it. But it didn't check, hey, does this thing already exist or not? So what if we could write into this directory, into var dt app config app manager, What files would we want to change to be 555 if we can read, to be able to read? Right, the important thing is there is that we can read anything. Uh, shadow. Yeah, etc shadow, right? If we can get access to the shadow file, then we can start cracking some hash, uh, cracking some passwords and trying to break, uh, break the application. And so it's exactly how this attack works. So if you looked at the permissions on etc shadow, on this system, root had read permission, everybody else had zero permission. Right, we've seen how to read this. So we can see, okay, this directory is owned by root and the group is other. So here the user is just read and all the other permissions are nil. Nobody else can do anything with this file. So then what we can do is as a normal user, we could create a symbolic link from var dt app config app manager generic display zero point that symbolic link to etc shadow. 
So now, when we run dt app gather, it's going to try to make a directory on this var dt app config app manager. It like opens it, it tries to set the permissions, and then it says, oh, like file exists, and it probably errors out because it wasn't expecting there to be a file there instead of a directory, but it still did stuff. So then we check the permissions of etc shadow. What are the permissions of etc shadow? Yeah, we want to be 555. Five, five. Read execute for everyone. Right? So we've got this program to change. It's a set UID program. Right? It has all the possible capabilities of root, but the way it's coded and the way the program is intended, it should only do this one little thing. Right? But instead, we're able to actually trick it into changing a file that we control and making a file that we want read accessible mm -hmm. because it just changes permissions without checking if that file already exists. So how can we fix these attacks generally? So what's, what are some of the takeaways here? We should not only check if the file exists, but also if it is a symbolic link or points for something. Yeah, so we should be checking before we open files, right? What what type of file is it, right? Mm -hmm. It's an important thing on modern Unix Linux systems, right? Files, you can actually have multiple types of files, right? What are some other types? So they can be links, symbolic links, hard links, they can be actual files, they can be directories, what else? Devices, devices yeah, they can be devices, right? They can actually be the hard drive itself. Um, they could be pipes, so Unix pipes, right? Or uh, sockets, I think it's also called like Unix sockets, right? So that's a way for applications to communicate. So yeah, if your program thinks that it should only be reading from a file, right, you better make sure that when it opens something that that thing is a file, that you need to actually do these checks to make sure your program is doing what you think it's doing. So you should check for unexpected types, you should check if it's a symbolic link or not, right? That's going to affect what you're doing. So what was so this DTAP application, right, was creating a temporary file. But what was the problem with that? It wasn't checking if the file already existed or not. It wasn't checking if the file already existed or not, yes, but what else? Why else could we do it? Let's say it Let's say it still wasn't doing that. Is there another way they could have tried to hide this or prevent this? No. They had some error catching logic that they got some kind of error, right? That aired out. So, right. But it still changed file permissions even after it aired. You know, it got some error. So. Yep. Yeah. So it's uh, it had file error permissions. Um, What kind of file? Well, this was like a temporary file, right? Yeah, so it was predictable, right? We could predict exactly which file it was going to open, so we knew exactly which thing to create, right? Yeah. Also, if it's using set UID, it should immediately undo that set UID thing as soon as it, what it needs to be done is done. It's a general set UID approach that I think we may talk about later. Uh, it's often hard, though. This was right at the start, right? It hadn't gotten to do the thing that it probably wanted or needed to do, right? For a web server, it's really easy because you only need set UID to find support 80. And once you find support 80, you never need to be root again, so you can get rid of that. Um, but for a lot of applications, the whole point is the program needs, the whole program kind of needs to be run as root. Um, then you get into, well, then we should design our program to separate the privileges out, right? So that only that thing that needs root is root, and whereas everything else, all these temporary <coughs> files and everything are in separate processes with different permissions. Uh, that is a good design goal. Yeah, so one of the big problems is we shouldn't, these temporary files are predictable, right? We are able to know the exact file that was going to be created, and we were able to create it first, right? So the fact is that it was a symbolic link, and it was a temporary file that we could predict, right? So this is another instance where essentially randomness or lack of randomness comes in to impact security, mm -hmm. right? So where is another place that we saw this randomness? EGP sequence only? What was that? EGP sequence only? 
Yeah, so TCP sequence numbers, right? So if the sequence numbers aren't random enough, we can inject into TCP strings, we can hijack TCP strings, we can do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, so if you want to make temporary files not be predictable, you should use this system called make s temp. What's the s for here? Secure. Secure, yeah, really <laughs> annoying that it's just one letter. Should be like make temporary secure, comma, every other version is insecure, don't use them. <laughs> End comma. Uh, actually, for me, that's one of the crazy things about these languages. Once you have make temp, right, you can't ever change that name. So you have to make a secure version of make temp. But a secure version of make temp means the other version is inherently insecure. So you should have called it like make temp insecure or just delete it and never ever use that stupid function. Ever again. <laughs> That was actually one of the things that impressed me when I looked at the Windows 8, the Metro apps, mm -hmm. is they're using JavaScript, right? I mean, they're using JavaScript and C Sharp and everything, but uh, they use JavaScript, but functions like eval in JavaScript are very inherently insecure, or like write HTML, also insecure. So they actually change the names. So by default, it does proper escaping and everything when you write HTML. And there's a separate version called write HTML insecure so that you as a programmer actually know that you're doing something insecure when you're calling this function. So you better make sure you're doing it for the right programs. Uh, anyways, interesting thing about language. All it is is the S. It could be interpreted as makes temp, right? Like, anyways, it's very frustrating. This is actually, yeah. Okay. In my mind, a lot of the cause of the problems is developers don't understand the difference between the two, right? And it's clear from the name. Why would you ever understand that? Okay. Let me get to one of my favorite class of attacks. Talk to, talk to, tick tock. Uh, it actually does stand, oh, uh, that wouldn't be any fun. I was gonna say, it'd be fun to guess what this acronym is, but I think it's too long to try to come up with something coherent that's mildly security relevant. Okay, so what this whole thing stands for, it actually is kind of nice, so the talk to kind of sounds like a clock, right? Tick tock, talk to. So it's time of check to time of use. So the idea is if your application, so as we just saw, right, right before, the application checks, so the problem was the application wasn't checking that that file doesn't exist before creating it. Right, that was the example we just saw. So you're, you wanna solve this, how are you gonna write the code that checks it? this was the var see I want to get the actual one <coughs> of course that's exactly what I wanted to do okay var dt <laughs> app config app generic display zero right so this is the file so you're writing the code to check this so you want to check Let's just talk about checking if this file exists first before opening it. Right. So what am I gonna do? If, but like, we'll just make up functions. They don't have to be perfect. If there's a fire. <laughs> System, how do you determine whether this file exists? Generically, I don't have to go into that. I read the ex2 file header and then do all this other stuff. Traverse the path down to the enclosure to get there and see if it's 
Okay. Yeah, traverse the path down. So you start at root. You see, does that have a folder called bar, a directory called bar? Does that have a directory called dt? Does that have a directory called app config? Does that have a directory called app manager? Is there a file or directory called generic display zero? And then you say, you return true if that file exists, or you return false if that file does not exist, right? Perfect. Then, do the operating system again. We get to this line, then we open up this. What happens here? It does the same thing, right? It says open, okay, start in slash. Does that have a directory called var? Does that have a directory called dt? Does that have a directory called app manager or app config? Does that have a directory called app manager? Okay, open the file in there, generic display zero. Which is, Which is well, we could say at this point, just open the file. Yeah, yeah it's going to be able to. I know it's all the other stuff, but it's a little bit more. Did this actually solve our problems? What was the problem? Right? One problem was that we were able to create a symbolic link there before the, the program accessed it, right? So does this solve our problem? File exists check, right? The operating system checks all the folders, checks, returns true or false so that file doesn't exist. And then later, right? So, you know, are these two lines going to happen simultaneously? No. Can, how many things can happen in between those files, these lines executing? Mathematically infinite. Say mathematically infinite. Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> Tricky to think about. It. A lot. We'll go with a lot. We'll go with a less, less mathematical version of a lot. Right? Maybe not in this process, right? This process has very clear semantics. This thing happens, this thing happens, this thing happens, right? But what else can be running on the system? Anything, right? We can be running multiple processes on the system. We can be doing anything we want on the system. So what if in between this var dt app config app manager generic display zero file exists check happens, it says nope, the file doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. Then before anything else happens, we create that symbolic link. Mm -hmm. Now when we open it here, what's gonna happen? We're going to open a different it's going to open that symbolic link, right? It's going to open var dt app config app manager generic display zero, which actually is a symbolic link to etc shadow. And it's going to chmod etc shadow as 055, mm -hmm. right? So this is exact. I mean, this is actually why it's such a cool name. Talk to. So uh, there's a there is some time, right, between the time of check when you're checking. In general, talk to is checking. Permissions, basically. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between you're checking some permissions and when you're actually using that that file uh, or those permissions. So here I'm checking permissions. I'm going okay. Var dt app config app manager generic display does this file exist? And then I'm trying to open that file by the string so the operating system has to find that file again. And in in between, anything could have happened. So how can we exploit this? No, no, that was just wrong code, sorry. That was bugging me. So if you want to exploit something like this using the other thing we just wrote, what would you do? What are some techniques? What are your goals here?
Yeah, so we need to somehow, in between these two lines, right, we want, before this line, we want there to be that file of uh, not existing, and then after that, we want there to be that, a symbolic link. How do we do this? Uh, probably we can be listening to uh, some function calls. I mean, we can list all the processes that are being, I mean, currently uh, executed in the system. And then if something like this props up, we can just say, okay, we can quickly go and create that. I don't think as a normal process, we can listen to the system calls of other pro people's processes. So that requires like debugging and more privileges. And once we can debug a process, we can actually have full control over it. Like uh, what event was, uh, as we mentioned, we would be traversing through the uh, folder folders mm -hmm. to the doing mm -hmm. this. So that would be a process system system call. So that would be listed, uh, even if it's not within the scope of this. Uh, exe this uh, Interesting. I don't know if that's true, but that could be a way to do it. Yeah, that actually you could see the traversal, yeah. and then when you see it hit some app manager thing, then you change, you make the symbolic link. Brute force it? Yeah, that's okay. right. You run, <laughs> run in them both as a, in two separate threads. Yeah. At the, and you just slightly start delaying the one that's going to run the file because it's just going to fail out every time. So right. as soon as it fails out, then you reset, you do it again, do it again, do it again. Yeah, that's actually the easiest way to do it. <laughs> is you just can have one continuous <coughs> process that all it does is create the symbolic link, delete the symbolic link, create the symbolic link, delete the symbolic link over and over. And then you just keep running this because you only need it to work once. Right? Once it works once, it's fine. So you just keep going on that. And you can actually, so here you're trying to get in between these two checks, right? So there's some time in there. So how can you increase that time so that you're actually more likely to get in there? Yeah. Running more processes? Yeah, you can run more crap. Just, it doesn't have to be processes that do that, right? You just run additional, create additional processes on the system so there's more load, so now the operating system has to switch between all the threads and everything. So you can actually increase this pretty significantly before these two, between these two. So you're increasing your chances of hitting it, and you only ever need to get it once. So there's actually another way to do it that is really cool. Um, so that's creating load on the system. You're basically trying to slow it down. What happens when one of these things in a path is a symbolic link? Let's say it opens up var, it opens up dt, it opens up app config, uh, it opens up app manager, and app manager is a symbolic link. Yeah, that that points to, right? It's going to go there, and then it's going to look up generic display zero in there. Um, so it's actually possible, so you can actually create these symbolic links that I think the limit is like 30 or something. You can have these crazy symbolic links that the application has to keep going down in order to finally resolve this generic display zero. So the idea is you make this process really long and this process of the open really long, and so you're increasing those times, so you're increasing the time between the actual checks. So you can actually do this. It's pretty crazy and kind of fun to do, to like make all these symbolic links and it just increases the time that you have to do this, so. That's why it happens like that, literally what changes between now and then. Okay, so talk to, time to check, time of use vulnerabilities, they're all about trying to exploit this race condition, right? There's some race condition in the fact that you're checking something versus where you're actually using something. Even though that gap is really small, as we saw, we can make it bigger. And we can just keep trying over and over. We only need to get that overlap once, and then we succeed. Um, so the time of check here is checking assumption A, right, on some entity. Right? So we're checking, does this file exist? Right? Then the time of use is we're actually using that entity, and we're assuming that A is still valid. Right? So just like in that example, We've opened, uh, we've checked, does this file exist?
And if it doesn't exist, then we open it. And we're assuming that the file does not exist when we open it. But we can control that. Right? We, there's that window in between there where we actually, uh, as the attacker, we have our own time where we can invalidate that assumption. Right? We can make it that there actually is a file there, haha, even though you just checked. Mm -hmm. It seems kind of crazy to think about. If you were to look at that code and be like, is it ever possible for the file to exist at this line? Mm -hmm. You'd probably say no. Right? I just checked right above there that that file does not exist. But the file system is independent of your program. Right? Other applications can mess with the file system. So that's kind of the key there. So, uh, yeah, you basically need to get your time of attack in between the two checking. Right? So if you can do that, you're golden. Uh, this can also come if you have some kind of race. Con so this is kind of like a, we talked about it as a, um, like a file system access problem. This can also come if you have a multi-threaded, multi-process application where you're accessing the same data, right? So somebody's writing to the data and they're checking that it's not valid or invalid and you're trying to, you're actually able to put some kind of, uh, to change the data in some way to alter the execution of the program. Um, so it's kind of more of a general way to talk about that. So specifically, in Unix, uh, the access system call, this is a system call that returns an estimation of, hey, can the program access this file? Right? And it's based on the real ID of the application. Ah, ah, ah. So what's the real ID of the application? So what are the different IDs? Of just user IDs, not oh. not group IDs. There are group IDs. There's another set of these for group IDs. Yeah. User IDs or group? Just like. Yeah, real ID would be the ID that the system, the process of which the program is running. Yes. So real ID is the the ID of the person who basically created that process, right? And what's the other type of ID? User ID. Oh, the actual ID. Uh, effective. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, effective actual ID. Uh, effective means, hey, I'm executing as if I was this user ID, right? So effective ID, so when we run a set UID application, our real ID is our user. Uh, that program is running as real user Adam ID, Adam, Adam D, but its effective user ID is root. So it's effect, so when it's file accesses and execution, it's accessing it as if it was root. But this access system call tries to estimate, hey, if we were Adam D, could we open this file? So why might this be useful? Not useful? Should get rid of it? So you're writing a set new, yeah. <laughs> executed this program could ex access it, right? We know we're root, we're effectively root as a site UID program. Mm -hmm. We know we can access everything. But we may want to check, hey, could the user who ran us, who started this program, right, maybe we want to execute something, uh, open a file on their behalf, but we don't want to allow them to just ac access any file, right? Only those files that they can actually access. So, the open system call, right? Open is how you open files. This checks the effective user ID. So, key question is, what do these what do these take in as their parameters? So, access takes in a character pointer, a string, right, of a file name, and the same with open. So, the code looks like this. Hey. If the access to file name is okay, right, this user can access this file name. Or I guess writable okay, so can the user access and write to this file? If that's zero, so zero in system calls means that it was successful, right? Not zero means that there was some kind of error. So if it can, 
then open it, right? So open that file name as writable. Uh, if that fails, then send an error. Otherwise, write some buffer to that file descriptor. So what's the problem here? What is the code trying to do? If you were to describe it in English, what is it doing? What was the intention? To create the file and write something to it. To create the file and write something to it. Uh, not necessarily create, but yeah, read write uh, permissions here. Uh, it will, mm, I think it will create it if it doesn't exist, the open file will. But it could already exist, we don't, we don't. Really care about that. But what's this access check? Why the access check? Yeah? It's trying to downgrade the power of the account that's using it. They don't want, they only want to write to this file if you, the person, the real user ID actually got it. Right. So this is from a set UID application, right? And it's trying to ask, hey, could Adam write to this file? Mm -hmm. And if I could write to it, then, so if I pass in file name for access to EGC Shadow, should say no, Adam can't write to that file. The program running as root root can write to that file, but Adam can't write to that file. And then this next line when we call open, it's checking can root open this file. So what's the problem here? Timing attack to do what? So what would you do? You could describe it at like a high level. Uh, to, well, it would check if the file exists and if the permission says that uh, either that it doesn't exist or it doesn't have rewrite permissions thing. Uh, after that, it, you would you would actually inject the file into that directory that does have rewrite permissions. Or I'm not for sure. So what's the check that we need to pass? So let's do that first. So first, how could we pass this check? Create what? Symlink. A symlink to what? The file that we can write. The file that we can that write to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the first thing, well, mm -hmm. okay, let's think about that. So first, we can create a symlink to a file that we can. Ah, yeah. We can create a symlink to a file that we can access. Right? Like a cat or foo or whatever. Any file that we own, we can create. And then, in that time between the access check and the open check, then what would we do with that symlink? Well, then we switch it to the file that we really want. To the file that we really want to write to, like etc shadow or etc password. Right? And if we just keep doing this and keep running this code, at some point our buffer is going to get passed to that file. Because you need to. The so we check this access check the permissions on the symlink itself, or does it? Ah, it's a good question. Don't know. I think it resolves it the symlink. Yeah. So it'll resolve to the the symlink. So um, that's actually something you can see from the example is uh, 
my symlinks have symlinks have their own security permissions, right? Uh, so Eric's question was, well, does the access actually resolve the symbolic link to what it points to, or if you pass in a symbolic link, does it just check that and open check the other one? Could check, yeah, probably both. I mean, it should go all the way to the end. That's the only thing that makes sense. Otherwise, it would be super trivial to fight that. Cool. Okay, so we'll stop here, and then when we get back, we'll talk about.